Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. This is Kevin. And in this week's video, we want to check out CompTIA's new version of their Network Plus exam. And the exam number is N10-008. And specifically in this video, we want to focus on what's new. Before we get into what's new, I want to give you an overview of the exam as a whole. If you want to check out the objectives for yourself and download a PDF of the individual exam objectives at a very granular level, you can go to this link on screen. And that's going to redirect you to a CompTIA page where you can give some information about yourself. And after you do that, they allow you to download a PDF of the exam blueprint. But at a high level, let's talk about some of the things that you need to know for the exam. They say 24% of the exam is going to cover network fundamentals. And under this category, we have topics such as the good old OSI model, different network topologies, cabling, IP addressing, IPv4, IPv6, common network protocols and the port numbers they use. Is it a UDP port? Is it a TCP port? We talk about network services here, such as network address translation, network time protocol. We even get into data center components here, as well as cloud. 19% of the exam covers network implementations. That would include knowing different network devices. Do you know the difference between an IDS sensor and an IPS sensor? And what is a next generation firewall? We talk about routing protocols and we get into not just RIP, but also OSPF and EIGRP and even BGP. Ethernet switching falls into this category and we cover topics such as VLANs and trunks and channel bonding and spanning tree protocol. And also under this category, we get expanded coverage of wireless technologies. I say expanded because they've added some topics since the previous version of the exam. 16% deals with network operations. Here we talk about things such as the different sensors that we might have throughout a network. For example, in a data center, maybe we have a temperature sensor so that if the room starts to get too warm because the HVAC system is failing, we can get an alert about that. We talk about different documentation that we should maintain. What sort of policy should we have in place? We talk about high availability and how to get high availability and how to recover from a disaster. CompTIA has also expanded their network security topics and network security makes up about 19% of the exam. And here we go over basic security concepts. We give you examples of different networking attacks. We talk about best practices for hardening your network. And since so many people access a network remotely, we talk about ways to secure that remote access, as well as physical security. And finally, network troubleshooting makes up 22% of the exam. Here we give you a seven-step troubleshooting methodology, so you can approach any network troubleshooting issue with confidence. And CompTIA's blueprint gives us several common issues when we want to troubleshoot cabling or wireless network or network services or just general networking issues. And we go through some of the different troubleshooting tools and command line interface commands we might give to glean some information from the network as we're doing our troubleshooting. But the main focus of this video is to identify some of the new topics on the exam. And I'm going to teach you a few of those new topics to give you sort of a sampling of what's new on the exam. One of the new topics that CompTIA has introduced is SD-WANs, Software Defined Wide Area Networks. So we can have logical WAN connections between a couple of our offices and the underlying infrastructure doesn't really matter all that much. We might be connecting from this place to this place over a 5G connection. And maybe from that place to yet another place, it's MPLS. We can have this overlay network built on top of the physical underlay network. And we can define that overlay network through software. VPNs or virtual private networks, that's a topic that was on the previous exam, but you need to know some additional terms in this version of the exam, such as what is the difference between authentication header and encapsulating security payload? Can you distinguish between a split tunnel and a full tunnel VPN connection? DNS or domain name services, that was on the previous version of the exam, but now you need to know more things about DNS, some of the terms that I have listed for you on screen. And one of the topics we're going to get into later in this video is a new type of cable that you need to know about. Not a coax cable, but a twin axial cable. We'll see what that looks like and where that's used in just a few moments. The previous version of the exam had different cabling tools. Well, now there's more, and I've listed some of those new ones on screen. We talked about VLANs in the previous version of the exam. In addition to that, you now need to know about voice VLANs. How do they differ? You also need to know about Ethernet port flow control. There's a couple of different ways this might work. 
And this is where one Ethernet switch can tell a sending Ethernet switch to slow down. You're sending too quickly. You need to know about redundancy when connecting out to internet service providers. And for your first hop redundancy protocols like HSRP, Hot Standby Router Protocol, VRRP, Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol, and GLBP, Gateway Load Balancing Protocol, you need to know how they act. Are they active-active or are they active-passive? Wireless troubleshooting was on the previous version of the exam, but now there are some additional topics. For example, you need to know the term effective isotropic radiated power. And on a router, you need to know what a sub-interface is. Why might we want to use one of those? We talk about how an infrastructure can be built out using code, something like Ansible. That's called IAC, Infrastructure as Code. Another term they've introduced that we'll talk about later in this video is multi-tenancy. And I mentioned that CompTIA expanded their security coverage. Well, they include different network attacks that we should know about. And we talk about different defense in-depth strategies not covered on the previous version of the exam. And we get into wireless security in more detail as well. And when we talk about physical security, we talk about something called a man trap, how you can properly dispose of your assets, and what a smart locker is. CompTIA also added to their high availability topics, having high availability with cloud. And what I thought we would do next is cover a few topics from this list of new topics. Let's first of all take a look at a security topic. This is an attack type that an attacker might launch on our network. Let's say that this attacker is in VLAN 1 and they want to attack a victim. Maybe they want to do a denial of service attack to their victim which is in VLAN 5. And maybe under normal conditions, we don't allow people in VLAN 1 to be routed over to VLAN 5. What an attacker can do is hop VLANs. And there are a couple of ways they might do that. They might do something called switch spoofing. They can tell their laptop, for example, to act like an Ethernet switch. You can use a tool like Yersinia, and that can send out DTP frames, dynamic trunk protocol frames, such that the attacker's laptop appears to be a switch. And some Ethernet switches left at their default setting will form a trunk if they receive a DTP frame. So the attacker, using a program like Yersinia, can send out a DTP frame to the switch, and that's going to dynamically set up an 802.1Q trunk. Now this attacker has access to all VLANs. A trunk carries traffic for all VLANs unless we prune off some of those VLANs. So the attacker is going to say that here is a frame destined for VLAN 5. That's the VLAN tag we put on it. The switch says, I know where VLAN 5 is. It's off of switch 2, and it gets routed over to the victim. Another way that an attacker might hop VLANs is by doing something called double tagging. Here, the attacker is adding two VLAN tags to the frame. They're not claiming to be a switch here, but they're adding a couple of tags. Now, they're on VLAN 1, and if we leave the native VLAN on a trunk set to VLAN 1, we could have an issue. Here's what the attacker is doing. They're sending a frame to the switch that has an outer VLAN tag of 1 and an inner VLAN tag of 5. When the switch gets that, it says, oh, this is going to VLAN 1. Well, you know what? My native VLAN on this trunk is VLAN 1. And what do we do with a native VLAN? we don't include a VLAN field. That's what a native VLAN is. It doesn't have any VLAN field. So we strip off the VLAN 1, revealing the VLAN 5 tag. So now the attacker can get traffic into VLAN 5 because Switch 1 just stripped off the VLAN 1 header, exposing that VLAN 5 header. Now, by the way, in this type of attack, the double tagging attack, there's no way for the victim to communicate back with the attacker. So it's one-way communication, but that could still be used by the attacker to launch a denial of service attack, as an example. Another topic that we mentioned earlier was a new type of copper cable that you need to know about. It's called a twin axial cable, and it looks like this. The reason it's called a twin axial cable is that it has a couple of inner conductors. Now, where would you use such a cable? Well, typically, it's in data centers. And we're going to be going at very high rates in a data center, so we're not going to go very far over copper. In fact, it's got a distance limitation of about 7 meters. The speeds that it can carry include a 40 gig speed and a 100 gig speed, speeds we typically see in data center connections. Next, let's talk about multi-tenancy. That's a new term for us. And to understand multi-tenancy, let's think about tenants in an apartment building. 
Let's say that we have tenants one, two, and three in this apartment building. And even though these tenants have their own isolated apartments, they can lock their doors and tenant two cannot just wander into tenant one's apartment. They have some isolation from one another, but they share the resources of the apartment. For example, the apartment building has some sort of a water service coming in and they have electric service coming in. Well, the tenants get to share in those services. Now, how does this apply to our data centers? Well, in a data center, we might have a single server that's going to service multiple tenants. If we had just a single tenant, it might look like this. We've got the server hardware, and then we've got the hypervisor, such as VMware ESXi. And maybe this single tenant has a few different virtual machines running on this hypervisor, VM 1, 2, and 3. Or we could use that single server and hypervisor to serve multiple tenants. We could say that tenant 1 has three VMs, 1, 2, and 3. We could say that tenant 2 has a single VM, and tenant 3 has a couple of VMs. That's a way that a service provider, for example, could have multiple customers be isolated from one another, yet share that underlying server hardware and hypervisor, giving us some cost savings.